it is crazy when I think of how far we have come in our belief series and how much further we still have to go. Um, in our small groups today, uh, we, were, we were looking at uh, God's view of, of, of us and how much he loves us. Like Brenda said, it was for God so loved the world that he gave his only son um, was our uh, passage for in our small groups today. Today, here, uh, we're going to be looking at God's call for us um, to be people of compassion. If you look in your sermon notes in your worship bulletin, uh, you'll see, and I've got to get my reading glasses on for this, um, what do we believe? Uh, and the title that I have for today, this is not from the book, is A Heart That Breaks. And I, I, that's what my prayer is for all of us, that God would create in us a heart that breaks. The key question is, what about the poor and injustice? And the key idea is, I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. I forgot a period there, sorry about that. And then the key verse is John 3.16. Oop, oop, oop. That's not John 3.16. I forgot the, the text on that one. I've got it in here. I, I, I made a mistake on that. Um, It'll be right up on the slides. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Let's bow together and let's pray. Father, of all of the topics that we have covered so far, this is the eighth one. And of the two that we're going to continue with next week and the week after in the first segment of our Belief series, this is the one that I struggle with the most. And my guess is that I'm not alone in that. Lord, sometimes it's as though we have cataracts on our eyes so that we can't see the need around us because the needs are so great and so many people are experiencing needs and so it's almost out of self-defense that we don't see. Father, remove the cataracts from our eyes and soften our hearts so that we can have hearts that break when we see people who are poor, homeless, hungry, hurting, oppressed, and the list goes on and on. So speak to us today, Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. So we had a question last week that we actually started the sermon with and we concluded the sermon with, and it was this question. How does God see people and what would happen if the church saw people the same way God sees them? That is a huge question. It has an easy answer and a profoundly difficult answer as well. And it is the same answer. That if we see people the way God sees them, then it calls us to action, and that is hard to do uh, because it is not easy and it is oftentimes not fun because it means getting down and getting in the trenches with people who are having difficult times. Now, as we're going to get ready to look at that in just a moment, I always like to start in kind of an easy way, and it's not a Jeopardy answer today. Um, it's going to be a quiz, and this is a real easy quiz. I think you will get all of the answers correct. So those of you who are in school, if you oftentimes don't do well on quizzes, you'll do well on this one. Uh, and for those of you who were in school and didn't do well on quizzes, you'll do well on this one. Uh, so here it goes. The opposite of rich is... Okay. The opposite of slow is? Okay, two for two. The opposite of hot is? 
man, you all are incredibly intelligent. <laughs> it's way easier than the questions I had last week. The opposite of sour is? The opposite of love is? Are you sure? See, that is a trick question. I've heard, a, what are some other words that could go in there instead of hate? Fear could be one. What was that? I heard it. Brenda has not seen my notes. That is the word. And let me explain why apathy is the opposite of love. Because if you hate someone, you have emotion that is attached to it. You are invested in it because either that person hates you or you hate them. You're invested in it. Apathy is you don't even give a rip. There, it's not even on your radar. It is as though they don't exist they are a nobody, a nothing, and they don't count. That is why apathy is the opposite of love. And that is what drove Jesus bonkers concerning the religious leaders and the church of his day. They neglected and they did not care about the people that we have just mentioned as we are going through some of those things, and we'll see a little bit more. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 38, 35 through 38, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. He saw the crowds. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. And we're gonna talk about that in just a moment, but before we do, I want to look at another passage in Matthew, and this is from Matthew chapter 25. It says, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did, or one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Today we're going to talk about compassion. And it is a topic that is difficult to talk about in our current culture and setting because people just don't seem to have a whole lot of compassion. Uh, to have compassion, uh, I think it means we have to take our eyes off of ourselves and to begin to look at other people and to look at their needs and to say, how can I intercede? How can I come alongside? How can I get in the trenches with them? In order to do that, we need to understand the definition of the word compassion. The definition is basically sympathetic pity and concern uh, for the suffering and misfortunes of others. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more in just a moment about how Jesus did that, but it is about, again, 
being stirred emotionally or intellectually or however you need to be stirred and I need to be stirred to notice other people and the misfortunes and the concerns that are going on in their lives and then to do something about it. The definition I was looking at went on to say, compassion is the response to the suffering of others that motivates a desire to help. Notice it said it motivates a desire to help. And then we cannot have, have apathy towards others and show them compassion. We're at a time of the year where um, it's easy to think about having compassion and reaching out to other people. Um, there was uh, an announcement that was in the weekly that talked about it's time for Thanksgiving and Christmas baskets. And y'all do a great job at that. Let me tell you, you do a fabulous job at that. This is one of the most giving congregations, especially for the size that we have. And every year, we, we more than can meet the needs of the people that are there. Um, by the way, if you're new to the church, this is a quick timeout. We do it a little bit differently here. We don't ask for you to bring in food. Uh, we used to do that. Uh, but typically, when we help down at Kapowson Elementary, typical first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth gr graders don't like beets and lima beans. And, and what we found people would do, I did this once, only once, I went through the, the, the cupboard and found stuff I didn't like, and that's what I brought to give to those families. And we found out that wasn't really the best way of doing it. So what we do is uh, we have people give just right Thanksgiving or Christmas on the memo line, and literally we go shopping, uh, and our, our little helpers go out, and we buy for Thanksgiving. They get food for the whole Thanksgiving break from school. So they'll get food, they'll get Thanksgiving food, they'll get Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday food. For Christmas, they get two weeks' worth of food, plus, uh, plus a, a Christmas meal. Um, and so, so compassion is something that's easy for us up here to think about at this time of the year. But let's just pause for a second and now please pretend that it's April or March or June. Uh, it becomes a little bit more challenging because it's not on the forefront of what everybody's thinking about. Compassion is about seeing someone or meeting someone and being able to see the need that's going on in their life and then coming alongside of them. doesn't mean we have, you have to give them money or anything like that, but it is interceding and intervening in the midst of the situation to say that somebody cares and that somebody is you. So, how are we going to do this? We need to look at Jesus' example because there are some things that really I think, point out the thing. First off is Jesus saw the crowds. He saw people. Um, that is so important. Now, how many of you know, there's a trick question, that we have a sign for the church right out here on the corner of 249th? Everybody should raise their hand, okay? Okay. Where's Greg and Janine? There they are back over there. What did your neighbor tell you about two weeks ago when we started, remo when you started removing all the stuff out there? What did your neighbor say? He said, oh, I see you like this little sign. Their neighbor, they live 400 yards, maybe 500 yards that way. Their neighbor had no idea that this church had a sign right there. And their neighbor has lived here for years. Let me say that again. Their neighbor has lived here for years and no had idea that, that, that this church had a sign right there because they couldn't see it. Why did they not see it? It has been there for years. It has become a part of the backdrop. You see, you put a sign up there and it stays there and then people see it, and then they see it, and they don't see it, and then they don't see it. Then it's still there, but they don't see it. When we first started doing our community dinners, we were putting the sign out here. We've got the big vinyl ones that, that we put out there a couple weeks early. And one of the people on mission committee said, no, 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 don't do that. It becomes a part of the backdrop. 
and then they don't see it. And about the time they don't see it is about the time the dinner is going to happen. So when we have a community dinner, that does not go up more than a week ahead of time. We try to put it up on either the Friday or the Saturday prior to the community dinner because otherwise it has become a part of the backdrop and they don't see it. See, that's the struggle. Right now, there are so many different needs and people hurting and homeless and hungry that we see them so often that they become a part of the backdrop and we don't see them anymore. One of the things about Jesus is he saw people. They had as many homeless and hungry people back then as we have percentage-wise today. They had people who were sick who would be kicked out because of their families considered them that they were sinless, I mean sinful, and that's why they were sick. And they were kicked out and they, you know, they just had to beg. That's all they did. And it became a part of the backdrop and people didn't see them anymore. And the first thing you notice when we read in that first passage is Jesus went out and he saw the people. He not only saw them as a crowd, but he saw them as individuals. Um, he saw what was going on around him. This is one of the things I think we need to do is we need to pray to see what's going on around us and um, to begin to look at the individuals out there, um, whether they're homeless or whether they're not, whether they're hungry or whether they're not. But start seeing people and not just the crowds. And then he didn't turn a blind eye. He saw stuff that was going on, and then he did something about it. So let's, let's think of a couple people, and I don't have these in my notes, but I just want to think of just kind of off the cuff. What's a person that Jesus, can you think of a person that Jesus saw in the four Gospels and then did something about it? Can you think of a person, just off the top of your head? The leper. He saw a leper, and, 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 he, and, and he healed that person. People got as far away from lepers as they could. So a leper was one person. What's another person that he saw and they did something about? It? The blind man. There's the blind man. Again, the person was viewed to be blind because of a sin that he had done or his parents had done. And Jesus saw the blind man and did something about it. He saw Zacchaeus, a traitor. He was a Jew who was working for the Romans. He was a tax collector. He basically could charge whatever he wanted uh, and people hated uh, that traitor. And he saw him, and what did Jesus do? He went, had, had a meal with him. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus became a person of faith. Uh, and so Jesus saw him and did something. What's another person that Jesus did something with? So. The woman who touched his rope. A woman who was having menstrual bleeding was considered ritualistically unclean. By her having continued bleeding, she was forever ritualistically unclean. And she went up and she touched the master and she was healed. If he would have been a Pharisee or a scribe, he would have been so angry because that lady just made him unclean. Instead, Jesus allowed her to be healed. See, see, see what he did? He recognized people that everybody else didn't want to see or neglected them or turned their head the other way um, when, um, when they saw them. Again, Jesus had compassion for people. If you want to know a, a, a horrible word to try to pronounce and say, that is the Greek word uh, for compassion, and Greek is what the New Testament was, Koine Greek was what the New Testament uh, was uh, written in. And the phonetic is off to the side, and I'll still let you try to say that if you would like to. Um, but here's what it means. I love the definition of the word. It is moved to the bowels. Okay, now let's think of what that means. That sounds like a weird thing. The ancient, uh, the Hebrews thought that the center of emotion was in your inner organs, in your liver, in your heart, in your lungs, and all of those sorts of things. In other words, to have compassion means that it is, let me put this up here, 
gut-wrenching when you see the person. That you have such an experience. I don't know if visceral would be the right word for it. Emotional change that it literally hurts in the guts when you see or you experience it. That's what compassion means when you read it in the New Testament. And so Jesus was moved with gut-wrenching feelings uh, that he was deeply distressed about. And Jesus would stop and he would do stuff and deal with it. See, that's one of my prayers for me, is that I would start having more gut-wrenching experiences when I see people in need. It doesn't take a lot, just maybe one or two. Uh, and then there will be more, and there will be more. And ultimately, Jesus took action. I love it when he feeds the 5,000. Well, it's either the 5,000 or 4,000. I can't keep them straight at this point. But when he saw that they were hungry, what was his response? And who was supposed to feed them? The disciples. I love it. See, they didn't have any compassion for them. They just saw that there was hungry people, and they said, Jesus, let's get them out here because, first off, Jesus said, you feed them. He said, oh, I can't feed them. There's, there's, it would take so much food. We can't do that. But no, Jesus had compassion the response of his disciples were, well, let them go off into the towns or someplace to get food because we, don't have, we can't feed them. See, there needs to be that gut-wrenching experience at times when we see people in need. Because when that happens, we will take action. So let's talk about our call to compassion. We need to see people like Jesus saw them. He saw them as unique special, loved in the eyes of God. And when they hurt, he experienced it. When they were lonely, he experienced it. When they grieved, he experienced it because he loved them that much. We can pray, Father, help me to see people in a new way. Now, how many of you have had cataract surgery here? Okay, there's, there's a whole bunch of hands that goes up. Let's see if my experience with cataract surgery was the same as yours. What was it like, Karen, you're in my small group. Can I pick on you for just a second? What was it like, your vision, after you had cataract surgery? Things were brighter and clearer. Would that pretty much sum it up for the rest of you who've had cataract surgery? Yes, Ron. He could see water coming down his shower door that he couldn't see before. Let me tell you, it was so amazing when I had cataract surgery. I had no idea the brightness. I'd forgotten how bright certain colors are and how vivid certain colors are. And it was like, whoa, this is pretty cool. Now for me, they did one eye because when I had all my retina problems, the laser basically destroyed my lens, and so um, they did one eye first, and it was like I could see colors in my right eye that I had forgotten existed. And then about three weeks later, or two weeks later, they did my other eye, and then it matched, and it was so cool. So if you're gonna have cataract surgery, don't be afraid of it. It's really cool. But here's the deal, I could see differently. And what we need is we need cataract surgery of our hearts so that we can see people like Jesus saw people. We need to pray that we'd be moved with a gut-wrenching feeling and be deeply distressed when we come upon someone who is in need. And there was that whole list that we saw there. We'll read the list again in just a second. And then we need to take action. And we do it as individuals sometimes, and we do it as a church sometimes. So there's times when we as a church band together to do it. 
But there's other times when we need to do it as ourselves. And so that is our call to compassion. Now, I'm going to talk about the warning here for just a second. Um, I read that part where Jesus was commenting and, and, and talking to it, said the righteous people, uh, that you saw these people and you did this and you did this and you did this. Here's the very next section of Scripture. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Should have gone on for the last one. We started with this question last week. We finished with this question last week. We started with this question this week. We finished with it this week. How does God see people, and what would happen if the church saw people the same way God sees them? I want you to think about, you don't need to answer that. I want you to think about what a church would look like that sees people like Jesus and has compassion on them. Gut-wrenching compassion. Let's pray that we can live a compassion-filled life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, too often I am like one of the religious leaders of your day. I don't even see the needs. And if I do, I go my own way. And my guess is, is that I'm not the only one that would confess to that. Because at times the needs around us are so great that we just think there's nothing that I can do. The Lord, when we think about world hunger, there's not much that we can do, but when we're confronted by one person who's hungry, there's a lot that we can do. When we think of the world that needs water and they're thirsty, there's not much we can do, but when we think of one person who's dying of thirst, there's something that we can do. Father, when we think of all the pain in the world, there's nothing that we can do, but or at least it seems that way, but yet when we find one person who's experiencing pain and hurt, there's something that we can do. Continue to stir us, Lord, as individuals and as a church. Lord, as a church, we do a pretty decent job. This is one of the most compassionate and caring churches that I've seen. Uh, this is a church that cares for the needs of our community. When you think of how small we are and the, the amount that we have done and continue to do for our community, it, it is mind-boggling. And word is finally starting to make it out in parts of this community of uh, people who are hurting and 
that this is a safe place to come, that this is a place that cares for people. Lord, help us to live compassion-filled lives. That when we see people, we would see them as you see them. And that we would be moved to the gut like you were moved to the gut. And that we would not be satisfied with doing nothing like the church of your day was like the religious leaders as individuals of your day were. But rather, Lord, move us to action, to get down in the trenches of life with those who need someone beside them. Lord, we can't do it on our own. So start small by helping us to be able to see need in individual people. Lord, that's my first prayer for us today. And then the second one, Lord, would be right after that happens, convict us to do something, move us to do something, then and there. And then repeat. Again, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would enable us to live compassion-filled lives every day.